Um, tonight we're going to um, uh, look at and discuss MN 135, the shorter exposition of action. I was going to do the longer one, but it's really long. <laughs> so, so we'll do this. The importance of this sutta is um, is that it, it fr frames the value of action and the actions that we take and the consequences of action. So uh, the importance of the karma, the results from our actions, determine what's going to happen in the future. And so uh, the Buddha here gives a, um, gives a very broad um, summary of uh, actions and consequences. And he talks also about its ramifications on, on uh, rebirth and what, uh, what rebirth uh, consequences result in in certain actions and um, and both on the positive side and the negative side. So he's going to talk about the sort of worldly consequences to it, but also the otherworldly consequences in other realms, the higher realms and the lower realms. Uh, but the important thing here is to realize kind of the, how things are correlated from certain actions, I thought it was very interesting how certain behaviors beget other kinds of um, other kinds of results, and we can uh, discuss it afterward. So uh, the shorter exposition of action. Thus, I have heard on one occasion. The Blessed One was living at Savati in Jetta's Grove, Anikbika's Park. Then the Brahmin student Sabha, Toidaya's son, went to the Blessed One and exchanged greetings with him. When this courteous and amicable talk was finished, he sat down at one side and asked the Blessed One, Master Gotama, what is the cause and condition why human beings are seen to be inferior and superior? For people are seen to be short-lived and long-lived, sickly and healthy, ugly and beautiful, uninfluential and influential, poor and wealthy, low-born and high-born, stupid and wise. What is the cause of this condition, Master Gotama, and why human beings are seen to be inferior and superior? Good question. Student, beings are owners of their actions, heirs of their actions. They originate from their actions, are bound to their actions, have their actions as their refuge. It is action that distinguishes beings as inferior and superior. I do not understand in detail the meaning of Master Gotama's statement, which he spoke in brief without expounding meaning in detail. It would be good if Master Gotama would teach me the Dhamma so I might understand in detail the meaning of Master Gotama's statement. Then, student, listen, attend closely, and I shall say, Yes, sir, the Brahmin student Subha replied. The Blessed One said this, Here, student, some man or woman kills living beings and is murderous, bloody-handed, given to blows and violence, merciless to living beings. Because of performing and undertaking such actions, 
on the dissolution of the body after death, he reappears in a state of deprivation, in unha an unhappy destination, in perdition, even in hell. But if on the dissolution of the body after death, he does not reappear in a state of deprivation, in an unhappy destination, in perdition, in hell, but instead comes back to the human state, then wherever he is reborn, he is short-lived. This is why, student, that leads to short life. Namely, one kills living beings and is murderous, bloody-handed, given to blows and violence, merciless to living beings. So here he's talking about <clears throat> perdition uh, to have a, an unhappy destination um, in perdition, even hell. So these are lower realms, uh, insect, animal realms, ghost realms. And, um, and then what happens when he comes back into the human realm that uh, he short lived. So um, in summary, we're gonna follow this form throughout a number of actions. But here, student, some man or woman abandoning the killing of living beings, abstains from killing living beings with rod and weapon laid aside. Gently and kindly, he abides compassionate to all living beings. Because of performing and undertaking such action, on the dissolution of the body after death, he reappears in a happy destination, even the heavenly realm. But if on the dissolution of the body after death, he does not reappear in a happy destination in a heavenly world, but instead comes back to the human state, then whatever he is reborn, he is long lived. This is the way, student, that leads to long life, namely abandoning the killing of living beings. One abstains from killing living beings with rod and weapon laid aside, gentle and kindly, one abides compassionate to all living beings. Here, student, some man or woman is given to injuring beings with the hand, with a clod, with a stick, or with a knife. Because of performing and undertaking such action on the dissolution of the body after death, he reappears in a state of deprivation. But if instead he comes back in the human state, then whatever he is reborn, he is sickly. In this way, student, that leads to sickliness. Namely, one is given to injury beings with a hand, with a clod, with a stick, or a knife. But here, student, some man or woman is not given to injuring beings with a hand, with a clod, with a stick, or with a knife. Because of performing and undertaking such action on the dissolution of the body after death, he reappears in a happy destination. But if instead he comes back to the human state, then whatever he is reborn, he is healthy. This is a way, student, that leads to healthy, namely one is not given to injuring beings with a hand, with a clod, with a stick, and a knife. Here, student, some man or woman is of angry and irritable character, even when criticized a little. He is offended, becomes angry, hostile, resentful, and displays anger and hate, bitterness. Because of performing and undertaking such action, he reappears in the state of deprivation. But if instead he is ugly, this is why, student, that leads to ugliness, namely one who is angry and irritable and displays hate and bitterness. 
But here, student, some man or woman is not angry and irritable. Even when criticized a lot, he is not offended, does not become angry, hostile, resentful, and does not display anger. Because of performing and undertaking such action, he appears happy. Then, whenever he is reborn, he is beautiful. This is why, student, that leads to being beautiful, namely, one is not an angry and irritable character and does not display anger, hate, and bitterness. Here, student, some man or woman is envious. One who envies, resents, and gains honor, respect, reverence, salutations, veneration, and receives by others. Because of performing and undertaking such actions, he reappears in a state of deprivation. But instead, he comes back to the human state. Then whatever he is reborn, he is uninfluential. This is the way, student, that leads to being uninfluential, namely one who is envious toward the gains, honors, respect, reverence, salutation, and veneration received by others. But here, student, some man or woman is not envious, one who does not envy, resent, the gains and honors, respect, reverence, salutation, and venerations received by others. Because of performing and undertaking such actions, he reappears in a happy destination. But if instead he comes back to the human state, then whatever he is reborn, he is influential. This is the way, student, that leads to being influential. Namely, one is not envious toward the gains, honor, respect, reverence, salutations, and venerations received by others. Here, students, some man or woman does not give food, drink, clothing, carriages, garlands, scents, unguents, beds, dwellings, and lamps to recluses or brahmins. Because of performing and undertaking such actions, he appears in a state of deprivation. But if instead he comes back as to the human state, then wherever he is born, he is poor. This is the way, student, that leads to poverty. Namely, one does not give food and lamps to recluses and brahmins. So when he says recluses and brahmins here, he's speaking about worthy worthy persons and this is um, noble, the noble ones people who are worthy of gifts and uh, the Buddha talks about that in, in some other uh, suttas but here student some man or woman gives food and lamps to recluses and brahmins because of performing and undertaking such actions he appears to be happy destination. He appears, he reappears in a happy destination. But if instead he comes back to the human state, then whatever he is reborn, he is wealthy. This is why, student, that leads to wealth. Namely, one gives food, etc., 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 and lamps to recklessness and brahmins. There's a dot leader there, and the dot leader means he's kind of dropping out some of the things in the phrases. <clears throat> Here, student, some man or woman is obstinate, arrogant. He does not pay homage to one who should receive homage, does not rise up for one whose presence he should rise up does not offer a seat to one who deserves a seat, does not make way for one whom he should make way, and does not honor, respect, revere, and venerate one 
who should be honored, respected, revered, and venerated. Because of performing and undertaking such actions, he reappears in a state of deprivation. But if instead he comes back to the human state, then whatever he is reborn, he is low-born. This is the way, student, that leads to low birth, namely one who is obstinate and arrogant and does not honor, respect, revere, venerate, one who is honored, respected, revered, and venerated. But here, student, some man or woman is not obstinate and arrogant. He pays homage to one who should receive homage, rises up for one presence who he should rise up, and offers a seat to one who deserves a seat, makes way for one whom should be made way, and honors, respects, reveres, and venerates one who should be honored, respected, venerated, and revered. Because of performing and undertaking such actions, he reappears in a happy destination. But if instead he comes back as a human state, then whatever he is reborn, he is reborn highborn. This is the way, student, that leads to high birth, namely one who is not obstinate and arrogant and honors, respects, reveres, and venerates, one who should be honored, respected, revered, and venerated. Here, students, some man or woman does not visit a recluse or Brahmin and asks, Venerable Sir, what is wholesome? What is unwholesome? What is blamable? What is blameless? What should be cultivated? What should not be cultivated? What kind of action will lead to my harm and suffering for a long time? What kind of action will lead to my welfare and happiness for a long time? Because of performing and undertaking such action, he reappears in a state of deprivation. But instead, he comes back to the human state. Then, whenever he is reborn, he is stupid. This is, why, this is the way, student, that leads to stupidity. Namely, one does not visit a recluse or a Brahmin and ask such questions. But here, student, some man or woman visits a recluse or a Brahmin and asks, Venerable Sir, what is wholesome? What kind of action will lead to welfare and happiness for a long time? Because of performing and undertaking such action, he reappears in a happy destination. But if instead he comes back to the human state, then whenever he is reborn, he is wise. This is the way, student, that leads to wisdom. Namely, one visits a recluse or Brahmin and ask such questions. Thus, student, the way that leads to short life makes people short-lived. The way that leads to long life makes people long-lived. The way that leads to sickliness makes people sickly. The way that leads to health makes people healthy. The way that leads to ugliness makes people ugly. The way that leads to beauty makes people beautiful. The way that leads to influential makes people uninfluential. The way that leads to being influential makes people influential. The way that leads to poverty makes people poor. The way that leads to wealth makes people wealthy. The way that leads to low birth makes people low born. The way that leads to high birth makes people high born. The way that leads to stupidity makes people stupid. The way that leads to wisdom makes people wise. 
Beings are owners of their actions, student, heirs of their actions. They originate from their actions, are bound to their actions, have their actions as their refuge. It is action that dis distinguishes beings as inferior and superior. When this was said, the Brahmin student Sabha said to the Blessed One, Magnificent Master Gotama, Magnificent Master Gotama, Master Gotama has made the Dharma clear in many ways, as though he were turning upright what had been overturned, revealing what was hidden, showing the way to one who was lost, or holding up a lamp in the dark for those with eyesight to see forms. I go to Master Gotama for refuge and to the Dhamma and to the Sangha of Bhikkhus. Let Master Gotama remember me as a lay follower who has gone to him for refuge for life. Rather short sutta, but packed full of advice. I mean, that's a lot of stuff, but the bottom line is the actions of our consequences of our actions. Um, we don't have to wait until the next life to see. We can see how that comes out. And the notion of karma um, and its consequences, um, we can see even in an hour of meditating when we apply. Uh, the right effort, uh, we get good results. <laughs> and if we're lazy or um, <clears throat> or um, use don't apply exactly the right effort, the results aren't aren't as good. So, in that recitation this morning, we are the heirs of our karma. So, any thoughts or questions? David. I don't want to be stupid, so I'm going to ask a question. <laughs> so, is it true that if you don't ask questions, you're going to be stupid in your next life? <laughs> Apparently so. That's what the Buddha said. And, you know, I'm just going to take it. Anybody who can speak extemporaneously like he did here, um, understanding that this would be memorized and eventually put down into words and read thousands of years later, um, what, a, what a mind to be able to articulate ideas in such a structured way that they could be understood memorized and recalled, rememorized. Uh, that was a very meaty subject, but it guides our actions to be able to um, produce, produce actions that are beneficial. And instead of uh, saying something that might offend or get us in trouble, uh, we make an effort to always stay on the wholesome side of speech, the wholesome side of thought, the wholesome side of actions. And which was very much like the talk that I did the other night with the, um, with the Noble Eightfold Path. One time I was, <clears throat> I was in a, um, a conclave of various teachers from various religions and disciplines and a philosopher um, got in front of the group and had a few words to say about what people were talking about and he said um, he said yes and I think that the noble eightfold path is um, is not a path and it certainly isn't noble and so I 
took exception to that immediately, of course. Um, but his understanding, he didn't understand what, me, what noble meant and that it was a differentiation between um, um, awakened and unawakened and didn't understand what, what awakening was and the difference from it. So he had read just enough to be dangerous, and uh, but not enough to understand. So it was quite a slur to you know some of the Buddhist leaning people in the audience, but um, it was an opportunity to actually get to know this guy, and um, uh, he was a remarkable yoga teacher and a writer and a thinker. He was a PhD philosopher. And so consequently opened the door for an opportunity for me to question him about why he made that statement. And so it wasn't so much that I was offended. I really wasn't offended because I realized he just really didn't know, you know, the difference. But the idea here was that I had an opportunity to ask him, why do you think this? And then he would answer, and that says, well, why, what's the basis of why you think that? And it turned out he just really didn't know enough, and he hadn't read any of the early teachings. He had been reading commentaries, and he didn't understand that the transcendental practice, that it leads to a transcendental awakening to the reality as it is, not as you think it should be. And so, um, so we got to be friends. And it was actually, his statement was a wonderful opportunity. And then his wife appreciated what I had to say. And, um, and then she asked me to teach her meditation. So, you know, it all came around in a very, very noble way. Yeah, I'll say that the Buddha is many times questioned and, you know, people say, are you sure? What are you teaching here? And then the Buddha just turns them around and then they become monks. <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> well, I mean, the fact was, I mean, he did teach for uh, 45 years, more or less, and um, was very open about teaching. And he walked around the entire Ganges Plain in sort of northeastern India. Um, India is a big place, and so, but you imagine just walking around there, and it, obviously, it, so we've read some of the stories where he was, you know, quite famous. People would regard him as a master, but they're not calling him Buddha; they're calling him Master Gotama. So, he they were respecting him for a teacher, and historically, I only know fragments about it, but uh, there were, of course various schools of philosophy and religious practices at the time. This was actually the late Vedic period, which had been going for at least 10,000 years, where the Bhagavad Gita and uh, Upanishads uh, were given uh, birth from. And so the Buddha, before he became awakened uh, his life, his early life, he was uh, a rich kid's son. His dad was a king of a fairly large kingdom, and he had all the goodies. You know, it would be like having Stephen, Stephen Jobs as your dad, right? And so his dad was very protective and literally built him three mansions for in, ver in, in different parts of India so that he would have cool places to live during the rainy season, the hot season, and the dry season. So he could go to these, his, his mansions and hang out. And of course, you know, I'm sure there were parties and he was living the life. 
And so he was educated as a, as a, um, as, as a warrior class. He wasn't a Brahmin, but they were, people would call people who were distinguished Brahmins. So it was a, a word of, uh, of distinction. And particularly if you are born in that class, you know, there's four base fundamental classes people got born into. The Brahmin class and the warrior class, merchant class, and then the others. And so he was a warrior class, but he was also the son of a king. And when it came time to uh, marry, of course, all of these kings from other kingdoms would... Um, send their daughters with a retinue of, of, um, of people to visit him and his palace because they wanted to uh, have royalty marry royalty, and that was the idea. But he was educated in all of the uh, religious and um, religious uh, practices of the day, astrology, numerology, um, of course, the Upanishads. So he he was conversant in Sanskrit as well as the local language of the day. That was Pali. So even before he left on his journey to seek awakening, he was well known. People knew who this guy was. You know, it's the son of Steve Jobs. Okay, <laughs> you know, and he was going to be king too. So he was like, he was slotted to take over the company, you know, when his dad passed away, or at least retired. So that's a brief sort of background of, well, of how, how this, why people inquired to the uh, educated class of how to live, how to, how to act, what's proper, what's improper. That's the whole idea of, you know, why you should um, uh, offer um, opportunities for people of influence to have a seat instead of you take a seat. You recognize that they are, uh, they hold some social position or uh, are some entitlement um, in the military, they say rank has its privileges. It was kind of that way then. And I'm sure it was no different than in the European noble class at the time. Everybody knew everybody and everybody had their position. So, so we get a little look back into uh, what it was like uh, 2,600 years ago in India. This was the mindset. Any any anything else to add? Um, the part on generosity to recluses and Brahmins would that apply to like modern day India, where there might be more like con artists if you just donate to a random like renunciate on the street? Well, I've done that, <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't know they were. You know, they were. You know, they could have been. You know, a, a very, um, <clears throat> you know, very sacred person, or they could have been a bum. I don't know because I couldn't distinguish while I was there. But giving ten rupees to somebody who has their hand out, and you know, my gosh, these what's ten rupees to us is fifteen cents or something. I mean, it's like yes, it just feels good to just you know, give give money away. I would go to a bank and I would get a stack of 10 rupee notes just so that I could have the opportunity to give. One of my earliest teachers, Sujata, mentioned one time, he said about giving, he said, look, you're only gonna get so many chances to give. You know, the window is only open for generosity every once in a while. So, um, if you look at your life, I mean, how often do you actually have a chance to give somebody something? It's very, very, uh, very rare. And so this is the opportunity to, to make something better. It, and it doesn't, it's not a, a big thing, you know, you're not 
sending somebody off to college <laughs> you know with five dollars but putting uh putting five bucks or a dollar or whatever into somebody's somebody's bowl somebody's uh coffee cup actually i did that one time i actually put a dollar in somebody's coffee <laughs> guy was sitting there i went by and put a dollar in him. he looks like it was like okay the wrong thing <laughs> San Francisco. Yeah, so generosity is just, it's just, we only have, you know, so many opportunities to be able to, to give. And, um, you know, I, I always encourage my, my kids to be generous, and they are. So, and there's no better way to teach them than to actually demonstrate it. You know, you hear, I, I've had friends say, you know, I saw this homeless guy and I reached in my pocket and I didn't have anything but a $20 bill. So I stuck it back in and then I walked by him and I realized he needed it more than me. <laughs> Gave him the $20 bill and it's like, oh, makes it, makes their day. It's like, wow, okay, now you can retire. Uh, David, you may correct me if I get this wrong, but I think the Buddha had something to say about the sort of the effects of bad karma that um, that it it can be diluted by generosity and and good karma. So you still have to take the salt. You know, it's like taking, you get a handful of salt and if you have to like eat it, you know, it's it burns. But if you put it in 20 gallons of water and just drink the water, you'll never know it happening. But you've taken the, you've got, you, you got it, you took it. But you don't necessarily have to suffer. And um, <clears throat> my teacher, uh, Usilananda, do we have a picture of him? Is he in here? Is he back there? He's back there. Okay, so it was Bonte's teacher too, while we were lay followers of him. And um, I asked him one time about the bad karma that, I had made earlier in my in my life and I said you know it's like uh, I just every time I think of this I feel so bad and it's like I don't know what to do I can't get rid of the thoughts and he said don't think about it <laughs> and I said he said I said but you know I want to like kind of like try and Try and clean it up. And he says, yeah, don't think about it because these are unwholesome thoughts. Let those go. Well, I didn't, we didn't know the six hours at the time. Let them go and bring up a wholesome thought, a wholesome state. He said, just don't think about them. When they come up, let them go. Because he said, what you're doing is you're uh, kind of reimagining them, and you're um, you build a kind of a, uh, a a memory of that. You refresh the memory of that, and so um, I took his advice right away. It was really great advice, um, and uh, actually, some of those deeds that I did that I'm was regretful. I can barely remember, like, where was that? Who was that? I can't, you know, they have faded. And they, all of our memories fade. I mean, over time, it's re really funny. I was talking to a friend of mine who's about our age, David, and um, uh, I was talking to Sean and I said, I can't even remember a single teacher I had in grade school, middle school, 
and only one in high school. And it was like, you would ask me that like, you know, when I was 30 years old, 10 years later, I probably could tell you everybody. But because we don't refresh this stuff, we just let it go. And that's the beauty of the six R's, what we're doing here, is letting the unwholesome go. Just letting it go. And now after, you know, eight days of practice, it's just easy. It's so easy. And we can keep doing this all the way to the end of the retreat and on the way home and when we get home and wherever we go, it's portable. It's accessible, immediately accessible. Mm -hmm.